Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Laurel Westendorf. I'm part of the community relations team at the Deschutes Public Library. Ooh, sorry. Um, our presenter tonight is Marianne Perry. She's the Sexton and Oregon's first dedicated natural burial ground for tonight's program, Green Burial, the Greenest Way to Go. The Forest Conservation Burial Ground at Willow Witt Ranch. Um, sorry, I got switched up here. She's uh, Marianne Perry is also a certified home funeral guide and has been educated in the community on after death care, home funerals, and green burials for over five years. I'd also like to introduce Ms. Ray as our ASL interpreter this evening. Thank you so much, Marianne, for explaining what a green burial or natural burial is and the options available to us. You're welcome. And thank you for um, hosting us tonight, Laurel. And um, I appreciate the, the work of the Deschutes Public Library and all of our wonderful public libraries for um, really serving the community. And thank you, Ms. Ray, for um, helping this to be more accessible than it would be without you. Um, so welcome everyone and good evening. Um, it's uh, interesting for me to not be able to see you. So I do hope that at the end when we have some Q&A time that um, you'll turn on your videos if that works for you. Um, so yeah, my name is Mary Ann Perry and I am the Sexton at the Forest Conservation Burial Ground. And I am coming to you tonight from Ashland here in Southern Oregon. And the burial ground where I serve is um, just outside of Ashland in the Lower Cascades. It's part of the expanded Cascade Siskiyou National Monument. And it's also the ancestral homelands of the Lotgawa, Takilma, Shasta, Athapaskan Indians who were forced um, to forcibly removed in the 1850s and who um, are, are still connected, of course, to these lands. And I'll be talking about um, green burial, kind of what it is and the basics and sharing some resources with you um, where you can follow up and find out lots more information and resources on your own as well. And then I'll be talking just a little bit about the forest uh, conservation burial ground specifically and ways to connect with us if that's of interest to you. So I'm going to um, share some slides with you and um, let's hope that that is easeful. <laughs> yep, Any better? Is. Okay, let me go. Let me um, go back just so you can see okay. those photos that I was referring to. That's important. Um, yeah. So, so these are the photos that I referenced at first, and um, you know, green burial is um, environmentally the, the greenest way to go, and more options for disposition are. Um, coming up um, and I'll mention some of those as well. So like I was saying, green burial at its most basic is interment in the earth in a way that does not inhibit decomposition. So everything that is placed into the earth is biodegradable. And really, I think that with green burial, there's also an acceptance and or an acknowledgement of the reality that um, the body is going to decompose. and that is the intention of, of the burial. Um, so green burial also means non-toxic preparation of the body. So no embalming fluids are used. There are a couple um, embalming fluids that are considered green um, and one that is certified by the Green Burial Council, but in general, no, no embalming of the body. Everything that's buried the clothing, the shroud, and or the, the container or casket is, um, you know, organic materials. And then no vault or grave liner, which are often a uh, concrete, uh, sometimes metals, and sometimes plastics. So again, everything that is buried is going to break down. And the, the photo that you see here is, um, you know, a natural unfinished wood casket. And this one happened to be, um, you know, certified as a kosher casket. So anything that's labeled as kosher is uh, appropriate for green burial as well. And I just want to add in here that um, I'll talk 
you know, off and on about the Green Burial Council. So they're a national certification education and advocacy organization. And they certify both burial grounds themselves at a couple of different levels, determined depending on, you know, what, um, how the land is cared for and how the burials happen. They have a couple of different levels of certification there. And then they also certify funeral homes and burial products. So you can visit their website to see folks that have gone through their certification process. So green burial is a shallower grave. It's um, not the six feet under that um, we often hear when we hear about conventional burials. And the intention with the shallower grave is to be in the area of the soil that is the most um, supportive of the decomposition process. So we're looking for, you know, some more moisture, more aerobic activity, a lot of, you know, mycelial activity that are really going to be doing the breaking down of the body. And shallow burial also, you know, makes land um, available for burial that might not otherwise be either because of a high water table possibly, or maybe just shallow soil where you, know, where you would hit bedrock um, if you went six feet deep. Also the, the hummus of the soil and just, I, I call it just soil magic, um, really takes care of our bodies and takes care of you know, the, the heavy metals that are in our bodies and really anything else is um, all handled by the lovely soil. So no evidence of soil or water contamination um, that has been reported in or around green cemeteries, and also no evidence of animal disturbance. And so even with these shallow graves, um, you know, the Green Burial Council says at least 18 inches of soil is what is required to um, create what they call a smell barrier for wildlife. And um, yeah, so that is not an issue. I, I think it would just be too much work um, to get to an, an old decomposing body. So not something to be concerned about. And then why green burial? Um, so there are several uh, reasons. I mean, for some people, um, it's just a matter of you know, carrying out the way that they've lived their life into their after death care. So, you know, a lot of folks who come to us with an interest in green burial have been, you know, environmental activists, have been, you know, recyclers, have been thoughtful about their impact on the planet, and they don't want their death to create, um, you know, further negative impact on, on the planet. So um, green burial is a way to conserve natural resources. A lot of green burial grounds are also into, um, you know, just land conservation in general. And in our case at the forest, it really is about conservation. It's not, um, you know, preservation. We're not setting this land aside to be untouched. We are an actively managed um, forest that is, you know, used to see fires that helped manage them. And as fire has been excluded, We've, we need to do you know, more um, mechanical thinning and things like that to keep the forest healthy. So taking care of natural resources is an important part of green burial. Protecting the health of workers. And this goes from you know, the funeral directors who are exposed to formaldehyde in the embalming process, um, which of course we're not doing that kind of thing out at a burial ground, but when we think about the after death care um, as a whole. And then in the burial world, um, for folks that work in conventional cemeteries um, are often exposed to herbicides, pesticides, um, you know, whatever um, sort of other equipment they're maintaining that might have, you know, hazardous chemicals involved. So um, that's just something that is, you know, really not part of green burial. We're not, um, we're not maintaining a a green lawn cemetery by any means. And then of course, reducing our carbon emissions and um, protecting habitat. And so once an area is designated as a cemetery, that's what it stays as for forever, at least in the state of Oregon. So once the land has been um, set aside as a cemetery, it can never be developed and turned into something else. 
Um, a lot of folks often ask about the, the cost comparison, and this um, has some, you know, some level of um, helpfulness, I think. So on the left in the blue, when, this is a conventional lawn cemetery, you know, the price range for a burial in that area. And this is taken um, from Everplans, and it's kind of a compilation of conventional you know, conventional cemeteries. And then on the right, I'm just showing um, some of the basic pricing for um, our burial ground. And like anything that's a service, all of this ranges depending on, you know, what you choose, you know, where you live, um, the, the prices fluctuate greatly. And, and then this doesn't include if your family is choosing to hire a funeral home and the services that um, would be paid for there. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so this is one of my favorite uh, parts here, this um, graphic on the right-hand side. When we talk about natural burial, oftentimes we're also folding into that some recreation component, often some sort of agriculture or education. And so I'll share how that looks um, at the burial ground where I serve and just know that it's a, a theme in the natural burial world. So the Forest Conservation Burial Ground is located on the grounds of Willow Witt Ranch, which is a working ranch and has been, um, you know, since since folks um, stole that land really and, and started ranching it. Um, it's been owned by the, the current ranchers since 1985 and they have been restoring the wetlands and the forests and the meadows since then. And a part of the ranch is a certified organic farm. There are um, goats raised there. So they sell organic goat milk and organic chickens and organic chicken eggs. And then about three or four years ago, they um, created the Crest at Willow Witt, which is an educational nonprofit. The ranch um, is fortunate to be one of the designated outdoor school sites for the state of Oregon. A few years back, we passed legislation um, that all fifth and sixth graders would um, have an outdoor school experience. So the ranch is one of the locations where that happens. And, um, and then of course, the most recent development is the Forest Conservation Burial Ground. And also at the ranch, it's an, you know, an event space. So people are married there. It's a place for family reunions and family campouts. So we really do have the full cycle of life's happenings um, occurring at the ranch. You know, from, from weddings, from kids learning about forests to folks being buried, um, raising food, raising animals, all of that is happening um, on the same 445 acres of land. And you'll, as, as you look at other burial grounds, you'll often see an education component, um, often some kind of farming component, but really an intention to um, embrace all of life's activities within the space and also to be accessible and open to the community. Um, just a little bit about conventional cemeteries, um, which is, you know, what I'm most used to and where a lot of my loved ones are interred. And, you know, just by looking at these images of this lovely green grass and um, just imagining, you know, what, what is required to maintain this sort of environment. So, of course, there's lots of water, um, oftentimes pesticides and herbicides to um, keep that grass weed free and keep pests away. And, and then the maintenance, the ongoing maintenance of these grounds. And this is um, these lawn cemeteries for ease of maintenance, really for those large mowers. That's really why um, vaults are often required in burial in these lawn cemeteries. So a vault um, helps so that the ground doesn't subside as quickly so that those mowers can mow over you know, even terrain to make the maintenance more easeful. And eventually, just like a rigid container, like a casket, the vault, you know, no matter what it's made of, um, eventually is going to give in itself. So over years, many, many decades, um, you know, cemeterians and sextons still see, you know, the ground caving in and, you know, where they'll fill it in and reseed the grass. But the vault um, delays that. 
by some time. And, you know, in a natural burial ground, I mean, different natural burial grounds do it differently, but at the forest, you know, we make a mound and the mound stays and we've been open for a little over a year and our burials from, you know, uh, our first couple burials, the ground has settled quite a bit and, you know, it's still noticeable where a burial um, happened for the most part, but, um, you know, in a forest, it's it's not not as striking. The ground is uneven anyway, so it, it just sort of starts to blend in with the environment in a different way than, of course, it would in this setting. Um, just want to talk briefly about cremation. You know, cremation became um, is is still on the rise. Um, lots of folks are choosing cremation, and and lots of folks I think consider it the environmental alternative to conventional burial. And it very well might be if you're choosing conventional burial that includes embalming, that includes a metal or you know exotic hardwood casket, that includes a, a vault of concrete plastic or metals. Um, you know, if you're comparing it to green burial, then it's definitely not the more environmentally friendly choice. Um, you know, it's about a full tank of gas um, to cremate one body. And of course, the release of the, the different heavy metals and other toxins into our environment. And that little bit on cremation came out of this larger infographic that um, was created by the the Green Burial Council. And so you can just see within a year sort of how many resources we're burying um, in the earth, um, you know, resources that I think could be put to lots of other uses. And so from the embalming fluid, you know, 1.2 Olympic swimming pools full of embalming fluid into the earth, um, enough concrete to pave a sidewalk to the moon 28 times. Um, so there's, yeah. Quite, quite a bit of resources that we're burying. And um, like I said, with the, the vaults and that kind of thing, there's the maintenance thing, but there's also this cultural element of, um, of our loved one's bodies being preserved. And of, I guess of, you know, looking as much like themselves in life as they did sort of as long as they can buried. Um, which is really not, um, you know, not what I think folks who are choosing green burial are interested in. I think, like I said earlier, there is an interest in decomposing and, you know, people often say things like, I wanna become a tree. Um, and in green burial, you are gonna become the food for the life that is surrounding um, the area that you were buried. This is a, a great resource to find out um, about, you know, other natural burial grounds. And if you Googled this and found the website, you can actually download just individual states as well. The Green Burial Council's website is another great place to look for burial grounds that have been certified um, through them. And then I also, excuse me, I often encourage folks to, um, you know, if there's a, a cemetery near you, to go and talk to folks who work there and ask them, you know, if they've heard of green burial, if they would be open to it happening, um, if they would be willing to even set aside of their cemetery, you know, set aside an area in their cemetery that was exclusively for green burial. You know, all of this is consumer driven, of course. So if, if a cemetery hears enough people expressing an interest, um, then you know they're much more likely to to act on that. So I encourage the the communication and and also the education of um, other cemeterians, and then of course private land burial. And in Oregon, um, you know we're pretty pretty lucky that we are able to handle a lot of our after death care, including private land burial. And in my county here in Jackson County, um, the process for getting a permit if you live on land outside of the city limits, um, the, the permit to bury on your own property, it's, it's pretty, um, a pretty easeful and you know, relatively inexpensive process. So I walk people through that um, if they're interested in that as well, how to go about that. So that's something to consider if that's your reality. I also wanted to point out um, there, 
is a book by um, Elizabeth Fournier. She's the, the Green Reaper out of the Portland area, Green Burial Portland. And she has a book on planning your green burial and ways to go about that. So I encourage you to check out her work too. That's Elizabeth Fournier, F-O-R-N-I-E-R. -E yeah. Um, so when we are looking at burial shrouds and caskets, um, the options, you know, range greatly. And so again, it just is a matter of whatever is buried being biodegradable. And so a shroud can be as simple as an old cotton sheet, or it can be as elaborate as a beautifully woven silk shroud that, um, you know, someone, you know, handcrafted and is, um, you know, lovely. So you can you can make your own. Um, you know you would want to connect with the burial ground where you plan to be buried to check in about their um, you know rules and regulations around shrouds and containers. Um, the the casket well the shroud that you see in the upper right hand corner um, is crocheted actually. This woman's uh, group of friends who were you know sitting at her bedside in her final days of life. Uh, kept themselves um, busy by crocheting her shroud, um, which is what she wanted. So that's a, a lovely homemade shroud. And then the, the casket that you see in the center lower photo there um, is sold by, you know, probably most funeral homes and it's uh, a kosher casket. So like I said, anything that is uh, certified kosher um, also meets the criteria for green burial. And you know, families can make their own shrouds, like I said, or their own rigid containers also. Um, there's a cool option called Shelves for Life that I just like to tell folks about. There's a gentleman in the UK who you can email with your um, kind of body dimensions, and he will email you back plans for creating your own shelves, which um, assemble into a bookshelf for your living life. And then uh, when it's time for your burial, that can be reassembled into the shape of a casket. So multi-purpose objects, I love that. <laughs> and then again, on the Green Burial Council's website, you can look up um, products that they've certified and, and see, see what they have there. So I'll talk um, just a little bit about the Forest Conservation Burial Ground. Uh, this is um, the home of Willowit Ranch, like I said, and the, the burial ground makes sort of a horseshoe shape around this great entryway meadow on the property. And it's just over 18 acres, but we've only opened up about four of those acres that we've had surveyed so far. And so this is actually the site of our second burial. And we are at the, the base of an ancient volcano. So we have plenty of stones. Most families find the stone that they want to engrave um, that's come directly out of the grave itself. And uh, yeah, this grave uh, you can see is quite settled. It's down there in the center of the photo on the ground and uh, it was a, a shroud burial. So, so not as much of a mound that we see with a casket burial. And again, what you see when you uh, when you approach a grave, and um, you know some burial grounds uh, for digging the grave use a backhoe, like in conventional burial grounds. At the forest, we hand dig the graves, and the we I will have to say is the royal we. We have a, a crew of uh, ranch staff that uh, milk goats and uh, tend the farm, and when the need. Um, B, they dig graves also. And so one benefit of hand digging graves is that we're able to place the soil in these tarps that you see around the grave in the layers that they exist in. So we remove the topsoil and place that on one tarp and then the subsoil. And then eventually, um, because of where we are, we hit lots of clay and, you know, clay based soil. And so that the largest mound is always the um, clay. And then we take out the stones, of course. We cover the piles with these lo lovely evergreens. And then we also line the grave with these uh, evergreen boughs as well. And then we place a few more boughs over the casket or the shrouded body before we place the soil. And so 
you know, one reason that we do that is um, it's beautiful and the boughs in the grave create a, a, a soft landing for everyone to see. And then also they, the boughs themselves uh, create air spaces around the body, especially the shrouded body. And we know that that air is an important part of the decomposition process. So it's just, you know, a natural way of aiding um, that process. Here's a, another photo of the uh, ranch here. Like I said, we're in Southern Oregon. And so way off in the distance there, you can see Mount Shasta down in Northern California. And the, the center of the ranch, really the farm and the farmhouse and uh, the organic farm. And the burial ground is actually off um, to the right of this image. And it's mostly forested. Um, we are going to be opening up part of a meadow area. We're seeing, um, you know, like everyone else, we're seeing the effects of climate change. And some of our wetlands are drying up. And uh, the plants are showing that by converting uh, from wetland plants to dry land meadow plants. And so that makes it possible, um, you know, for burial in those areas. We can't bury, you know, close to water, of course, we have to be 100 feet away from any water source. So I'll talk just a little bit about um, home funerals, just because that is how I came into this whole world. And um, it's my personal passion and a way that I serve my community here in the Rogue Valley. And I know that there are um, some home funeral guides up in your area and some wonderful death doulas as well. Um, from the Peaceful Presence Project. So I'm, um, yeah, if you are interested in any of this, you can definitely follow up more with someone uh, right in your area or reach out to me and I'm happy to help make some connections for you. So, uh, you know, why a home funeral? Well, one is that it's legal, which uh, is news for lots of folks. Uh, it's uh, perfectly legal and in the law for families to take care of their own after death. And the, the loved one's body actually is personal property and belongs to the family um, after death. And it's an opportunity to, for the family and friends to really lead their own affairs on their own time, in their own rhythm. Um, you know, an opportunity like you see these uh, kids in the photo, um, having the time to, to decorate this uh, container. And this happens to be actually a cardboard container, which a lot of funeral homes, well, it's what funeral homes use as their cremation containers if the family doesn't want to, you know, purchase another kind of casket. But these can also be um, obviously used for home funeral and they can be painted and decorated and made lovely. Um, there's also, you know, the, the um, eco consciousness of doing things on our own, you know, it's a uh, non-toxic to take care of our loved ones at home, of course, and, and also the, the cost consciousness of it. Um, you know, it takes a little more planning and a little more legwork to do the paperwork and the transportation and all of that. But again, if a family wants to really, um, you know, take over all of these things and do their own thing, it's uh, perfectly legal and uh, can be a really helpful thing to do for some folks. And, and the meaningfulness, you know, I, I think that we can find and create meaning in, in whatever choices we're making. I will say with the home funeral, um, you know, there's just no one else to ask, you know, if you can, if you can do something, if it's allowed, um, you know, you're really doing the things that make sense for you and for your loved ones. So that's one of the kind of the, the avenues that I see around creating meaning, meaningfulness is that um, you're choosing all of that. And a home funeral can include um, any of these pieces. So, you know, bathing the body, which is just, you know, kind of a bed bath, really. Um, a home vigil. So, you know, having any sort of you know, you know, laying in honor of, of your loved one for, you know, a day or a couple of days, planning your own ceremony. Um, and again, with the transportation, you know, if it were that you were going to do some sort of service in a church setting, you know, we can bring our own loved one's body ourselves to the church and or to the crematory or to the cemetery, however you want to do that, making 
the arrangements for disposition. And we can file all of our own paperwork as well. Um, so all very possible and, and doable. Um, and I, I'll share a resource around that. Also, I wanted to share these couple of resources. Um, I've mentioned the Green Burial Council, lots of um, interesting articles, book suggestions, um, videos and photos on their website. And also the same with the National Home Funeral Alliance. They're an education and advocacy organization. And both of these organizations are um, you know, mostly volunteer run and they both have uh, conferences um, every year, or every other year um, for community education. So I encourage you to check out those websites if you are interested. And then the, the book on the right, Final Rights, this was created by the founders of the Funeral Consumers Alliance. And they're an education and advocacy organization for funeral consumers, making sure that our, helping us make sure that our rights are upheld um, within the funeral industry. And their book, you can also download the roles and regulations and everything kind of, everything after death care, um, you can download just by state from their website, which um, is a wonderful service. And then this latest resource that I am most excited about, I think we're the third state to have um, our website completed. So I think it exists for Washington and New Hampshire. And this is organfuneral.org. And so all kinds of wonderful resources and education for um, all things after death care related and especially helpful tips for folks who do want to do their own um, in-home family directed after death care. And this was created um, in part by Holly Pruitt, who is from the Portland area and does all kinds of wonderful education advocacy in the death care world. And she partnered up with a few other folks, um, one of whom is David Noble, who's a longtime cemeterian who ran Riverview Cemetery, one of the oldest cemeteries in the Portland area. So it's up to date. It is, um, yeah, just really well put together. So I encourage you to check that out. And um, I just my contact information for you. And I know that um, most of you aren't in my neck of the woods, but if you are, or if you find yourself visiting here, um, the burial ground is open to the public for self-guided visits, as well as the ranch itself um, every day of the year. Um, so I encourage folks to visit. We do have scheduled group tours a couple times a month through October, and then also happy to arrange private tours for people that um, wanna just come up on their own. So. You know, I invite people to visit and to be in touch. Um, I wanted to just briefly let you know that um, at the burial ground and, you know, you would want to inquire with whatever burial ground you're um, looking into if it's another place, but we do welcome um, cremated interment, cremated remains interment and scattering. And I don't know if you know, but here in Oregon, um, we're maybe a month or so into human composting being legal in our state, and um, which you can learn more about through um, Recompose is the business in Washington state that um, is operating it there. And then of course, you know, there's water cremation here um, in Oregon that is legal as well. So we have uh, several disposition options to choose from, which, um, yeah, um, all about choice and, and having options. So I think that is a good thing. Um, I am going to stop sharing. And yeah, and so I, I can, you know, go back and share slides if that becomes uh, important. But otherwise, I uh, welcome your questions. And I think that Laurel is going to make it possible that you can uh, turn your camera on if you want to do that. I'd be happy to wave to you and say hi. Um, and I also welcome your questions, your anything you're curious about, and or if you, you know, have a, a green burial experience that you would like to share or uh, in-home death care experience that you would like to share. I'm 
happy for you to um, bring that as well. We have about 20 minutes or so. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I've enabled everyone to turn on their video. I am gonna stop recording just so that everyone feels comfortable.